and not glamorous, like replacing the 100-year-old steam pipes, but um, he, is, he is one governor, um, and there have been on both sides of the aisle great governors of Connecticut, but he's one governor that was a transformational force for this university. Here's deeply about us, here's deeply about the environment. So he'd be very proud um, of what we're doing here this week, and I'll be sure to tell him about it. So the Metanoia tradition for, I mean, I know the faculty know about this, but the students may not know, um, that it's a tradition here at UConn. Uh, it came out in the 1960s. Um, UConn was a very active campus in the 1960s, so I really I encourage you to, I know you have a lot of spare time, go to the university archives and see what was going on here. It was, it was really a hotbed of student activism um, in, the, in the best of ways. And so since the 1960s, um, we have called upon this time Metanoia for reflection, for critical inquiry about the most urgent issues of our time. And um, few issues could be more urgent, more important um, than the subject of, of this year's events, and that's, um, and that's our environment. And the, um, the accumulated things to worry about, threats to the environment, are just are tremendous. And hopefully our students especially, because you know you guys got to do a better job than we did with the environment. Um, hopefully you're not at all debilitated or dampened by just how daunting some of the challenges are because, because they're big and it's, it's very serious. Um, a lot of people who are not as informed, not as engaged as you, who haven't had the opportunity to go to college, think that the environment is a thing that is fenced off you know, from the rest of all the social and political problems that we have in the world, um, that you can separate it from things like human rights or justice or progress. And um, this metanoia, one of the terrific things about it is it breaks down those barriers and shows, I mean, to call it interdisciplinary is such an understatement, uh, um, but it really it connects um, so much of what we care about um, as human beings on this planet. Um, our speaker today is wonderful. We're so incredibly lucky to have her here. Um, her work is a very good example of all these interconnections that you have to make, that we have to make, um, between the world's biggest social, among the world's biggest social problems, um, again, with it, social justice, illness, um, and freedom. So uh, she's going to talk about all these things today. Here at UConn, we do the very best we can to steward the resources that we have and to take care of our little, you know, corner of the globe. That's what we care about. And um, we did, uh, a few years ago, we adopted the Climate Action Plan. And so that, that's a plan to cut our greenhouse emissions by 20% by 2020. And we have achieved that, really, with some time to spare. It doesn't mean we're, we're done. Um, a lot of you know that uh, we, have, we have pursued sustainability in our dining halls. Um, that's a place of a lot of waste and where a lot of efficiency and environmental uh, protection is possible. Um, made water conservation a priority. Um, just a decade ago, a stretch of the river, the Fenton River, if you know it, um, near our well fields went dry. And uh, that was a big wake up call from the university. I wasn't here, thankfully, but um, lived in the, the after effects of it. And it was, a, it was a huge set of events and community concerns that um, hope, you know, that pushed us in the right direction. So uh, since then, we built the water reclamation facilities that recycles um, about 400,000 gallons of water a day. Um, sustainability in our buildings has been a priority. Uh, we have some projects right now that are going to be LEED certified and that we're, um, we're very excited about. Um, so even as, as we do these things, um, we know that greater commitment is needed. Um, but again, I can't underscore to students how important you are in leading the future. And I'm so, I'm so proud of our Eco Huskies and all the students here on campus who have, um, were shaking it all the time and trying to, to make everybody see the issues around the environment are, are central to our existence. And, um, and you guys understand that. So go out, make us proud, and um, keep learning. So thanks, everybody. I just want to quickly interject that uh, Metanoia is still going on. It's a semester-long event. This, um, this Metanoia, sometimes it's focused on a single day, but we're trying to extend it. But there's some signature events in the next week and a half that are still coming up. Uh, one that I'd direct you to would be in Conover Auditorium on Friday, and this is a panel discussion. 
So this is the intersection of climate, just, climate change and social justice. And uh, then the, in the Conover, the next day is the intersection between the environment and art. And Janet Pritchard is going to show some of her photography and look at the intersection between, say, culture and, and nature. So we're excited about those. And uh, the next day, or next week, we uh, have the dedication of uh, the hills, Hillside uh, Environmental Park. And uh, we have some distinguished guests. So uh, the commissioner of the DEP is going to come uh, for the ribbon cutting, essentially, uh, and opening of, of the park. So uh, I, I guess we had a very successful Tasty Wasty event today. I think uh, we served food to over 800 people and ran out of food. And several thousand people visited uh, over the course of that event. So it's, it's been a great semester. I want to underline or underscore President Hurt's message about student activism and how much you can do. I, I think that a few dedicated students uh, will get us to where we need to go. Um, I, you, we're going to win this battle in, in terms of renewables and and biodiversity, one corporation at a time, one household at a time, one building on campus at a time, and students can do that. That, that you can do. And legislation and policy and your journalism and the like. I'm going to turn it over now to Scott Wallace, who is going to introduce uh, Faith Jimmel. Scott's a new faculty member. Uh, he's an environmental journalist. He's been very involved with National Geographic at uh, various levels. He writes some of the pieces that you would be familiar with. He's also uh, produced uh, some of the, the movies that you've seen or worked on those. And uh, former CNN uh, producer as well. He's a, I, I have to say this. He's a little bit of Indiana Jones um, <laughs> as well. A little bit of a swashbuckler. He's uh, been all the way in our uh, Arctic Circle and above it. And, uh, deep into the Amazon to, to look at indigenous people. So, Scott, could you introduce uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, President Hurst, for being here. Um, to all of you who have come out tonight, um, students, faculty, um, and the administration, um, thank you for being here. Eighteen years ago, I uh, traveled to the Alaskan Arctic as a producer for CNN. We were interested at the time in doing an in-depth story or look at the controversy over drilling for oil in the Alaskan Arctic. And we were particularly interested in looking at that issue, um, a very controversial issue, of drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, through the lens of the two uh, indigenous peoples, the two nat native Alaskan peoples most impacted uh, and who live in cr close proximity uh, to the refuge, the Inupian Eskimos who inhabit the North Slope on the Arctic Ocean, and the Athabascan Gwich'in uh, caribou hunting culture who live, um, some of their villages are along the south end of the refuge and then extending into northwest Canada. While we were in Arctic Village, um, we met uh, and interviewed uh, Faith Gemmel. And um, her words and what she, the message she had, uh, her uh, passion, her um, articulate way of presenting her people's position, the strident opposition to oil development in this um, wonderfully complex and rich ecosystem that is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge um, impressed me and stayed with me all these years. And um, I, I, the, the Gwich'in have been in the forefront of the fight to keep oil development out of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, the, the, the Gwich'in are a caribou hunting culture and uh, they are very tied to the land and the caribou, uh, which sustains their age-old way of life. Uh, we are indeed very fortunate to have with us today Faith Gemmel. She uh, not only is an articulate, uh, passionate um, spokesperson for her people, the Gwich'in, but she has represented indigenous people on a number, number of, in a number of global uh, forums. Um, she is on the board of the International Indian Treaty Council. She uh, is the founder and former executive director of Red Oil, 
which is an organization uh, that stands for Resisting Environmental Destruction on Indigenous Lands. Uh, Faith has been um, at Standing Rock um, more recently, and um, she is also a member of the board of the National Wildlife Federation. Former. Former member of the board. In any case, um, Faith is, uh, we, uh, as I said, we're lucky to have her here today. Uh, President Herbst, students, ladies and gentlemen, members of the faculty and administration of the University of Connecticut, it is my distinct honor to present Faith Young. I'm just acknowledging the Creator and asking Him to be with me as I speak for our people. And before I start, I also want to acknowledge and honor people of this land, which were the Pequot, right? Are the Pequot. And this is their ancestral territory, so I want to acknowledge that. And if there's any Pequot here, I acknowledge you and thank you for allowing us to be here in your territory. And I just want to make one correction to the introduction. I'm the current executive director of Resisting Environmental Protection. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Red Oil is a grassroots network created by indigenous peoples of Alaska. Every nation in Alaska is part of the network. We have Yupik, Inupiaq, Athabaskan, Iyak, Dena'ina. So nearly every nation is represented. And we created Red Oil in 2002 when a massive energy bill was moving in Congress that we had to fight. And we actually got it voted down by one vote we won. And, um, it was after that we decided in Alaska that there was going to be more proposals that target our homelands, and we needed a we needed a um, way to to fight that. So we created this network, and I finally headed up the network in 2005, and we were founded. Um, with Indigenous Environmental Network was one of our main <coughs> founders too. And at the time I was staff of Gwich'in Hysteri Committee, which is the main political body that represents the Gwich'in Nation on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge issue. And so Red Oil stole me away. <laughs> um, our focus with Red Oil is sovereignty, self-determination, human and ecological health, and climate change and climate justice. Those are the founding pillars. And I don't just work on the Arctic Refuge issue. I work on, we work on every issue that indigenous peoples are impacted by in the state of Alaska, where a community member asked us to help them. And so we work on all the issues. Um, most recently, we defeated Shell Company last year, or two years ago now, for drilling in the Arctic Ocean. And that was a 10-year battle. Yeah. It was a good, long, hard fight, but it's gonna happen again. It's coming up again. Um, I just wanted to also start with who I am. I don't think many people know much about Alaska Native people or Alaska Native communities, unless you've been up there like Scott. <laughs> 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 um, 
But I come from a little tiny village. In our language, it's called Mashraik O, and it means steep bank by the creek. And that's where my people are. We're Nitzai Wichin. We're one band of the Wichin Nation, which is 15 communities in Northeast Alaska and Northwest Canada. We're an international nation. Um, our community is one of the smallest Wichin communities and is one of the most traditional. We held a gathering in 1988 when the U.S. Congress first wanted to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And we had a friend who was um, an environmentalist. He came and told our leaders that Congress wanted to drill there. And our leaders went and asked the elders, what should we do? And uh, the eldest, which in woman, she was over 100 years old. Her name was Myra Kiekovich from Canada, Old Road, Canada. She said, we have to hold a traditional gathering and decide the future <coughs> of our nation. So she, we called together the Wichin Gathering, and it was called Wichin Ninsa. And it was the first time that our people came together in over 150 years, because that Canadian-U.S. border separated our nation. And so we held the meeting in my village. I was only 15 years old. And, um, but I remember when those big DC-10s landed, the elders and the people from Canada were coming off the plains, and our elders were standing there and they were just crying, because they were finally able to see each other. It was very powerful, it was amazing. And the meeting by our young leaders was set up with an agenda. And our elders said, no, we're not going to do this like that. We're going to do this our way. So they threw out that agenda. <laughs> and they just set down the rules of the meeting. And they said, if you're going to speak, you stand up, address the people. You speak from your heart. Speak in our language if you can, and stay on topic. <coughs> and they opened up the floor to anyone. And nearly every person got up and spoke. We had chiefs, we had elders, we had young people. And from the heart, it was very powerful. And um, after three days of this gathering, we'd meet every day, and then we'd dance all night. <laughs> and then meet all day, dance all night. Um, by the third day, we already, we set, we, we knew what we wanted. And we created a political arm for our nation, which was which in steering committee. And they, the leaders of the steering committee were chosen then and there. Um, there was two from each region of the Wichita nation, so two from Northwest Territories in Canada, two from Yukon Territories, two from Yukon Flats, and two from my area. And their job, they were brought in front of the people and they were told their job, which is basically go out there, tell our story, do it in a good way, and we're going to be successful. <coughs> and we're going to be successful. That part, that was prophecy. Because everything about the Arctic Refuge fight is spiritual, and was spiritual. It started from a spiritual foundation. And it's amazing what we we're able to do. Hold off the largest oil companies, the US Congress, the state of Alaska, native corporations for over 40 years. And that's what we did. Nobody knew who we were before then. But by 1995, when this issue, the last time I was really engaged in the issue, um, everyone knew who we were. Seventy percent of the American public wanted the Arctic Refuge protected. And so we did our job. Um, this year is a different story, and I'll touch on that a little <coughs> further along. But my village, it's just a little tiny village, and my people, 
there are about 200 of us in the community. And our way, or how we live, is based on the land. Everything about our way of life is based on the land. We have hunting seasons. And so right now, springtime is coming. Everybody's going ice fishing. And then the ducks and geese are going to come back to Alaska, and we're going to hunt. And then summertime comes, and we're going to gather. And then fall time comes, and that's when the caribou comes and migrates right through on our mountain. And we move out on the land, and we live up on the mountain for about a month, <coughs> harvesting for the whole community to eat throughout the winter. And it's just a cycle. After that is moose hunting season, and then sheep. And then the winter, where it can get like 40 below is normal. 60 below is cold, <laughs> 70 you stay inside. <laughs> yeah, so that's how, that's our life. And my village is not very much different than any other village. That's how Alaska Natives live. We still live that old, we still have a lot of our old ways interconnected today with how we live. And it's a lot of health hunting cultures fishing cultures. Um, most of our communities, we call that way of life a subsistence way of life. And the state of Alaska coined that term. It's a political term. And basically it's about hunting, fishing, and gathering. Um, most people don't know what that means, so that's why I wanted to just let you know what it meant to us. When I say subsistence, that's what I'm talking about, our way of life. Um, a lot of our communities are really small, very isolated. There's no roads to our communities. And in the summertime, you might reach communities by boat or in the winter with snow machine. Otherwise, you'll have to fly into the communities. And so imagine the cost of food or gas, or anything else. Um, today I spoke in a class and I was letting them know the costs in our community, like a gallon of gasoline in my village is $10. Um, for food, a can of coffee, $30. A uh, pound of hamburger meat is $12. And so these are the costs we pay. So for us, subsistence is necessary. We have to hunt, we have to fish to survive. We can't live off of, we don't have the economy to live and buy at the store. It just supplements our traditional diet. And so, um, it's not any different than any other village in Alaska. They're all pretty much subsistence-based communities. And so for Native people to continue to live this way of life, our environment has to be intact because it's solely interdependent with the environment. Nowadays, transnational corporations are more desperate, less scrupulous in their quest to seek more sources of oil, gas, coal, and it's usually our homelands that are being targeted and these short-sighted quests for new sources of fossil fuel. To understand our current situation in Alaska related to oil and gas development, um, you have to understand the history of Alaska and what happened that created the situation we're in. Um, land claims happened to us. And that will give you a little bit of context to the destruction and legacy of oil and gas development in Alaska. So I'm going to go back a little bit. The oil companies and the federal government aligned themselves to promote an act to create the 800 mile Trans-Alaska Pipeline. The, the U.S. Congress unilaterally passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, we call it ANCSA, in 1971. 
and ANGSA was meant to legitimize U.S. ownership and governance over indigenous peoples in Alaska, our lands, and access the resources. Under ANGSA, for-profit native corporations were created and established. These native corporations partner with the multinational companies now, whether it's oil companies, mining companies, timber, the timber industry, etc., depending on what resource is in that nation's territory. Um, the sole purpose of a corporation, as you all know, is profit at all cost. And whereas in Alaska, the tribes, purpose is to look out for the health and well-being of the people. Two different purposes. These native corporations have that one goal and we have a different vision. Um, so two contradictory purposes are put in place. Many Alaska natives believe that ANGSA was an illegitimate infringement upon our rights as Alaska Natives. And it was put forth to eliminate Aboriginal title to our ancestral homelands, access and exploit the resources, assimilate Alaska Natives, incorporate us into Western society value system, and ultimately divide and conquer Alaska Natives. It's the same tactic that the U.S implemented when dealing with indigenous peoples anywhere in the past, historically to now. Um, and that's what happened in Alaska. The act was created without our voice or vote in 1971. A small handful of Alaska Native leaders, a small handful of Alaska Native leaders were brought to Washington, D.C. to negotiate land claims. And in their negotiations, they were told that ANGSA was the best policy that they would ever get. And if they didn't agree with it, no land claims were going to pass. So they were basically coerced. And they were told by the elders before they left, go down and get our land claims. And so they felt they had to agree. And they thought that they were getting title to land claims in Alaska, but once the act passed, they realized what it really was. And what happened was when these native corporations were created by the act, title of the land, all of the subsurface title, was transferred to the newly created for-profit native corporations out of tribal hands. And then surface title was transferred to village corporations. And there's 13 regional corporations. And there's over 227 village corporations. Um, no title was left where it should be. Some tribes maintained sovereignty. Met the Kotla, they have a reservation, Indian country status. Uh, my tribe, and it's Aywich Inn, we opted out of ANGSA. We chose to keep title to our land. So we own 1.8 million acres um, in fee simple title, private land. But the rest of the tribes in Alaska were all umbrella under ANGSA. And so no one escaped it. And they didn't have a choice or a vote, or a say. So after it passed, we tried to do our best to, to make it serve us. And <coughs> like on the North Slope, they have a lot of oil resources. They realized that the corporate leaders that were from the community had to learn very quickly how to run a corporation they had to hire lawyers <laughs> to protect their interests. And um, 
there's a clause in ANCSA that if they didn't prosper and if they weren't successful those first few years, they could get bought out or sold to another corporation, which would have meant title of ancestral lands would have been, went out of native hands to anyone. So it could have went to any corporation, like BP. So they had to prosper. So they partnered with the companies in their territories. And they started doing what, they started using the assets they had, which was the land. <coughs> so on the North Slope, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation partnered with oil companies and they drill for oil, and they are a billion dollar corporation now. Um, in other areas like Southeast Alaska, they had timber on the land. So the native corporation there partnered with the timber companies, and they profited from the timber industry. Um, what's unfortunate is there's no more, there's no more old growth, because they inherited a lot. Um, in some areas, there was minerals on the land, so those corporations partnered with the mining companies, etc. This is what happened when the ASA passed in 71. And it's been ongoing, these partnerships, to this day. Um, when I talk about it, I always say ANGSA, in a nutshell, I try to put it in a nutshell because it's really hard to understand. Um, not hard to understand, but it's hard to get a lot of that information real, real quickly down. So I say in a nutshell, ANGSA was a theft of our ancestral lands to bring our energy resources to market. It was assimilation policy. It undermined our own traditional values, which was based upon respect for the land and replaced it with the Western value system of profit. And it was an act to divide and conquer us. So you have traditional villages and traditional tribal councils who have a different position than the corporation, native corporations. And all the powers with the native corporations because all of the financials are there. And so we have a lot of deep divides in Alaska where the people that are most impacted are saying no and the ones in power are saying, yes, let's drill it all. Um, and the reason that we say it was an illegitimate act is because we weren't allowed to vote. And we didn't have a voice in it. And it impacted us. It's still impacting us to this day. So I like to speak about this issue because it gives a people it gives people an idea of what happened. We didn't just hand it over. You know, we we still maintain we have title to Alaska because what was done was illegitimate. And we still talk about this issue because we want to bring it back to Congress to do the right thing. And what has to happen in Alaska for that to happen is we need to organize ourselves and educate our young people about our own history, the truth. And once they understand, let them move forward with bringing it back to Congress because it can happen. And I'm hoping it will happen in my lifetime. Because I think if the land was transferred back to our tribes, we would make good decisions about the use of the land and not allow massive development that's happening right now to happen. Because Alaska is unique and special. And there's places in Alaska that are not anywhere in the United States and they deserve protection, like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. You don't have muskox in anywhere in the U.S., do you? <laughs> do you have polar bears anywhere in the U.S.? We do. And that place is one of the biggest areas of threat right now. Um, the reason I want to talk about ANCSA is because after that act passed, it started this cycle of destruction 
in Alaska where development started popping up all across the North Slope. Anywhere there was minerals, oil, gas, fossil fuels, development started popping up. And there's a lot of um, pollution and it's it's going to take years to restore what we originally had. Um, and just to give you an idea, I'm just going to do a snapshot of the North Slope and show the environmental footprint of the oil companies up there. So in the North Slope, the sprawl is over a thousand miles. There are more than 5,549 exploratory and production wells. 225 production and exploratory drill pads, over 500 miles of roads, 1,100 miles of trunk and feeder pipelines, two refineries, 20 airports, 115 pads of living quarters, five docks, 36 gravel mines, more than 390 gravel pads, and 27 production plants gas processing facilities, seawater treatment plants, and power plants. As for air quality and pollution on the North Slope, Prudhoe Bay air emissions annually are over 70,413 tons of nitrogen oxides, twice the amount as emitted in Washington, D.C. annually, and that's according to the U.S. EPA. Other pollutants are uh, 1,470 tons of sulfur dioxide, 11,560 tons of carbon monoxide, 2,670 tons of volatile organic compounds, greenhouse gases and large quantities are emitted annually including 24,000 metric tons of methane and 15.26 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Spills and waste discharges on the North Slope there's over 450 spills annually on the North Slope. 45 different substances from acid to waste oil have been spilled routinely. Between 1996 and 2008, there were 5,896 spills, which totaled more than 2.7 million gallons of toxic substances such as diesel crude to hydraulic oil. So that's just, that's the footprint. And that's just on the North Slope. That's not even talking about any other area in Alaska where these companies operate. And that's just a little tiny snapshot of what's really going on with that. Um, so as you see, we're disproportionately impacted by <coughs> development up there. And <coughs> those statistics speak for themselves. And they're worse. These are old statistics. They're worse now. <laughs> um, the thing about the Arctic Refuge is that area was the last 5% of America's only Arctic coast that was still protected. 95% of Alaska's coast on the North Slope is open to oil and gas development. That was the last. 5%, which is why we fought so hard to protect it. Because it's public land, everyone in the U.S. has a say what happened to that area. Um, this, I think it was in November or late, late last year was when the tax bill was moved forward and the Arctic Refuge Line item was in the bill. So that happened, and the reason that happened is because it was a must-pass bill in a Republican-led Congress, and it was the only way to get Congress to pass that. If they had allowed debate on the merits of the Arctic Refuge, it would not have passed. And so they had to circumvent the normal process just to pass that. 
Um, since they've advanced drilling there, um, they're trying to move forward drilling and development as fast as possible. <coughs> so they're trying to move forward um, the EIS within one year, and they're limiting it to 150 pages, which is unheard of. <laughs> and they're going to pass it very fast. Um, they have not even had a meeting with the Gwich'in people. And we are the stakeholders. We're the ones most impacted. And they're moving forward without even coming to meet with us and discuss with us how to move forward. We're the experts of that herd. We're the experts of the time. <coughs> And the Trump administration, Department of Interior, has not met with our community yet. But they're pushing forward map fast development. And the reason they're pushing forward development really fast now that they had the tax bill move forward is because they believe they need to move forward and get a drill rig in place and working before the next administration comes in because they think that the next administration will make a wise choice and reverse their bad decision. <laughs> and so they're just railroading everything through right now. We're going to fight. We didn't give up. We didn't give up when they passed the tax bill. Um, our people made statements that it's not over until that first bill where it is in place. And until then, we're just going to fight every step of the way through the whole scoping process, EIS, etc. We're looking at legal venues, and we're just going to continue to fight because our way of life is on the line. Our survival is on the line as we change people. Um, Many a new Piat from the only community that is within the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Kaktovik. Many of the Inupiat from that community actually want the refuge protected too, which is mostly not heard out here. If you hear about the issue, if, if you hear our senators or congressmen debating it on the floor, they say nobody wants protection except the Wichin. <laughs> And that's not true. More than half of the Alaskans <laughs> want that area in the most recent polls. And so this issue isn't over. It's not done. And we, we're going to fight. We're just going to continue to fight even though uh, Trump pulled a fast one <laughs> and his administration pulled a fast one. So I just wanted to touch on that issue first, because that's where I'm from, that's where my people are from, and that's one of the issues that's most dear to me and my work. I've traveled everywhere speaking on that issue, and um, all the way from small communities to universities to the United Nations, talking about the human rights violations that drilling in the refuge brings for our people. Which is, I want to um, switch from that to talk a little bit about climate change in Alaska <coughs> and why we're fighting so hard. My people, we knew about climate change back in 1988, but nobody knew about it. We knew about it. They, they could see what was coming the elders, and they talked about it then, and it came to be, and now we see what they were talking about. I was um, speaking to congressional offices, and I was talking to them about climate change over 15 years ago, before all of these climate disasters even happened, and I remember sitting there and telling this congressional member one day there's going to be so much climate disasters that you're going to be spending millions of dollars to address those climate disasters. Isn't it um, smarter to not drill in places like this, start moving towards clean energy so we avert the worst impacts of climate change? 
I remember that discussion. And now, it's reality. <laughs> um, but in Alaska, climate change is very real, and it's happening very fast, and we know it's because of the burning of fossil fuels. <coughs> um, that's the leading contributing factor to global climate change. In Alaska, most of the impacts are seen throughout the entire state. We see altered weather patterns, more severe storms, erosion of coastal areas, greater precipitation, thawing permafrost, melting sea ice, receding glaciers, increased incidence of spruce bark beetle infestation, increased in severe forest fires, declining fish populations, migratory habitat disruption of all of our subsistence resources, um, disruption of all natural cycles of life. That's what we see now. A lot of the impacts include our loss of our rights because if, if our resources are impacted, it affects us. Um, some of the communities or one of the most major impacts that's happening is coastal communities are looking at relocation due to climate change. There's three that need to be moved immediately and no one's putting a bill for that. Oil companies aren't. The state of Alaska isn't. The federal government isn't. So these three communities need to be relocated. They don't have the funding to be relocated, but it is an emergency situation. And they will be relocated. They don't want to be relocated, though. That's their ancestral territories. But they're being forced to relocate. Um, that's right now. It's projected that as climate change worsens, 80 coastal communities will need to be relocated in Alaska. So all of the communities that are along the coastlines will need to be relocated. And that's because of sea ice erosion and more severe storms due to sea ice erosion. Um, all of this, these impacts are because of the incessant demand for energy to feed the high consumption energy appetite of America. That's why we see all these impacts in Alaska. And that's why a lot of our traditional territories are being targeted. Um, our ancestral ways of life and homelands are imperiled by these devastating proposals. In some communities, there's actual, like in my community, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is across the river. Let's say that's our backyard. Our front yard is the Yukon Flats. And Canada's right here. What's happening is we've been fighting to protect the refuge for years, and they just have the green light. Um, there's the Yukon Flats. There's many companies that are seeking to drill for oil there, but also looking at mining. <coughs> and there's 66 indigenous communities that are located along the Yukon River. So if mining and oil development is allowed in the Yukon floods at the headwaters, it will impact all those 66 indigenous communities. And so it's our front yard, our backyard, and we're being surrounded. Um, like in northwest Alaska, there's, a, there's an Inupiat community called Point Hope. They're the ones that are fighting to protect the Chukchi Sea from oil development because uh, their subsistence way of life is based on whaling. And the Chukchi Sea is where it's a migratory route of the whales that they hunt. 
Um, so they're trying to protect that area. And they were partners with us in fighting Shell to stop development there. So they were fighting that in the front yard. In their backyard, the coal companies are trying to develop coal. And then there's already Red Dog Mine operating. And that has been operating for over 30 years. That's already impacting the water that they do. So they're being surrounded. So places like this, like our community, Point Hope, indigenous communities that hunt and live from the land, how are we going to survive if all of these projects move at the same time forward? We won't be able to survive. This is what's happening in Hawaii. It's not just the Inupiaq and Point Hope. It's not just Wichita and Arctic Village. It's many communities in the state of Alaska facing the same threats. And it's all of these industries that are bringing them. It's the mining industry, coal companies, oil and gas. And so it's about life and death. It's about survival for us. That's what these issues are about. And at the same time, we're dealing with all of these major, major impacts of climate change. Where in the summer times, Alaska's burning up. And most of the year, the ground is melting under us. We're literally, the ground is literally melting beneath us and we're burning up. <laughs> That's what's happening in Alaska. Most of the lower 48 don't see these impacts of climate change, but we do. And I can tell tons of stories of other impacts that we see in our little village. This is just statewide, but I was just ran through. Um, so for us, we really, really want to move forward an agenda of clean energy. That's, that's the only way we're going to survive. But it's not just us, it's all humanity. Because we're not the only ones impacted by climate change. It is happening everywhere. It's global. Um, I was going to talk about the health of oil and gas development, the health of the people. I'll just give a couple ideas about that. There's a small community on the north slope in the western Arctic that's called Nuiqsut. This community, they had a small amount of asthma back in the 80s. And then the oil companies came in and negotiated deals with, with the leaders of the community. And they made promises to the people. They said, we're only going to have a small little footprint. And if you allow us just to drill this little area, You'll benefit financially, and it's a win-win. The leaders agreed. And what ended up happening is the oil companies broke every single promise they made to those people. And now New Exit is surrounded by oil development. Feeder pipelines, refinery, everything. There's flaring happening up there. And that community, the people, used to have caribou come right by their community. They have to go about 40 miles now to get caribou. And the former health aide, she works with our people with red oil. She stated that when she started as a health aide in the 80s, there was about two or three people that had asthma. And when she left her job as a health aide, 80% of the community had high rates of asthma and upper respiratory illnesses. That's due to being surrounded by oil and gas development. Um, so that affects, the, that affects the health of the people. And another issue that affects the health of the people is persistent organic pollutants. Persistent organic pollutants are where industries pollute in the south and it impacts the north or impacts the cold regions. So, all of these industries that operate here in the United States, the, pollu the pollutants that are emitted into the air, they migrate to cold regions. 
So they migrate to Alaska, and the north. And once they're in cold regions, they don't, they by or accumulate, and they grow. And then when it warms up, they drop back into the environment, into the food chain of all of the animals that we're hunting. So what's happening in Alaska is we have high, high rates of cancer in our communities throughout the whole state. And we, we see cancers in young people nowadays too, which we've never seen before. When our people lived mostly on our traditional diet in the past, before all of this industrialization, we lived, we were healthy. And most which in elders live past 100 years old. Nowadays, we're lucky if we have elders that are 80. And so the health of our people is impacted by the industry, especially where there's development happening. And I just wanted to touch on POPs because that's one of the reasons why Alaska Natives have such high rates of cancer. Some of the current issues, too, besides that is um, when Obama was president, he tried to protect the ocean. So he protected hundreds of acres, thousands of acres in the Beaufort Sea, the Chukchi Sea, and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, it's protected. <laughs> and then Trump rolled that back and is targeting those areas too. So now that fight is going to come back up. And people are going to continue to try to protect the oceans again. The one interesting thing with that now is the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, which is an Inupiat native corporation, they're actually signing up to drill in the ocean themselves against their own people's wishes. If you go to a community on the North Slope, if you talk to the people, they want to protect their way of life. Um, there's very few that want to gain financially from developing the ocean. But those few, they're in power. And they're the ones that run the corporations. <coughs> so the people up there need need people to understand that it's not the ones that are most impacted making those decisions. Power is making those decisions, even in small communities in Alaska. Um, but we did manage to get Shell out, so I still have hope. And as long as we all continue to do our best to protect certain areas, I have hope because that was a hard fight, but we won. Um, there's more areas in Alaska that are under threat right now. I guess one of them I should mention too is, has anybody heard of the Pebble Mine? Pebble Mine is a mine that's being pushed in the headwaters of Bristol Bay. And Bristol Bay is where world-renowned salmon comes from. And the Yupik <coughs> and the people of that area, the Aleut, they, they subsist from salmon, but they also um, commercial. They, they do commercial fishing. And it's their livelihood. Um, that area, fortunately, is not under threat for oil. But all of the other waters in Alaska under Trump's new plan, new five-year plan, are under threat. Everything else around the North Aleutian Basin, <laughs> which is worse than before. <laughs> so it's not just the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea now. It's the Gulf of Alaska and its other areas. And we have a big, big fight for offshore areas in Alaska. Um, the main thing I wanted to stress tonight is 
you know, this profit, profit at all costs and business as usual mentality of the United States, that's our greatest challenge. And we can't try to create more profit from the devastation, and that's what's happening. As the climate changes, as we see more global warming, all these companies are saying, well, now the ice is gone, let's go drill for oil out there. And that's not what we should be doing. You know, that's not realistic. We need to move forward real solutions. Um, and a green economy as a solution. Because the decisions that are made today by our, by our leaders will affect the rights of our unborn. And we can't take that responsibility lightly. We ought to be weaning our addiction to fossil fuels now because it is a finite resource and we are using up all the fossil fuels that we have. Even if they drill everything in Alaska today, there's no way we would become we would become independent. That's just a real reality. In Alaska, we actually have optimum areas for clean energy. All of the coastal areas are high wind areas. They can have wind energy. That can supply their communities with all their energy <coughs> needs, and they won't need to drill for oil or gas. Um, in my area, even though we're 110 miles above the Arctic Circle, in Northeast Alaska, we could actually run our community on solar energy three quarters of the year, according to a pilot project that we did up there. And so Alaska Natives want to be leaders and players in creating a new economy in Alaska. And it has to happen. But what's happening is instead of our lawmakers and leaders working on making that happen, they're actually just trying to drill for every last drop that's left before they make a shift. <coughs> that's not very wise at all. And then we're going to be in crisis, and then they're going to make the shift. So we're really pushing leadership in Alaska to start looking at alternative energies now, clean energy now. Let's shift our reliance now. Let's start transitioning and move away from dirty fossil fuels, especially since we're the most impacted of climate change. And so drilling in the Arctic Refuge is not the answer to anything that they keep saying. And they keep saying the sky is falling up there. Have you, heard, have you ever turned on the news in Alaska you feel like the sky is falling the way they talk. <laughs> it's like, we're running out of money, we're running out of oil, we need to drill here right now, today. And that's the rhetoric. Every day on the news. But they just need a wake up call in Alaska. And that's what we are. We're that conscience, we're that wake up call. We're saying no more, let's ship now. And we're just trying to get more people involved and engaged and louder and create more movement in Alaska. And that's what red oil is about. That's what we're doing. So that's why I went to Standing Rock. We supported the people there. So when we do a call out in the future, we never know what's going to happen. They will come and support us. And that's what needs to happen all across the U.S. People need to support each other to protect these last places that are left. And I just gave you a snapshot of Alaska. The same thing can be done for the lower 48. You have Dapol, you have Keystone, you have other areas, very important areas that are being looked at and encroached on that need to be protected. We all need to do our part. We need to stand and defend these areas and protect it because it is our survival on the line, humanity's survival on the line. My people, we had a prophecy. We have a prophecy. It's called Voice from the North. And in our prophecy, it said that a time is going to come when humanity 
is going to there's going to be a great war, right? This war is going to be fought in the north. And when this war is being fought, it's going to be a war of words and not weapons. Words and paper, not weapons. And when this war is being fought, when people learn of it, that's the wake up call for humanity. It's time to change what you're doing. And that, to me, describes the art of refuge issue. And that wake up call is now. And it's time for humanity to start listening to what's happening. Dapple was part of that wake up call, Standing Rock, where there's a reawakening happening. They believe a reawakening is happening. People that. So I believe that both these issues are part of prophecies, ancient prophecies that are coming to reality. And it affects every single person in this room. All of you young people, you play a role. You play a role in what happens because you're the most impacted. So you have to stand up for yourselves. For your children, your grandchildren. That's what these issues are about. That's why we stood at Standing Rock, and that's why we're standing in Alaska for our ancestral territories. It's for humanity survival. And I believe that we're going to do the right thing. But it's just going to take a lot of movement and a lot of people moving in the same direction waking up people in Washington, D.C. and around the world. Leaders around the world need to wake up. It's happening slowly, but it needs to happen faster because we're at that point in humanity where we're making a choice. We're either going to go down a path of destruction or a path of light. And that's what our prophecy is about. I have faith that we're going to go <laughs> choose life and we're going to do the right thing. But we just have to move it forward and make it happen. And you all play a role in that. With that, I just want to say thank you.
for questions? What are some other areas that are experiencing similar uh, impacts that uh, the northern part of Alaska are experiencing in terms of indigenous people being uprooted from their from their ancestral territory because of oil exploration? In Canada, it's happening in other areas around the world. I've been down to the Amazon. It's happening there. Um, there's actually policy that moves it forward in other countries. What I found out when I was in Ecuador was um, we met with these small tribes in the Amazon and I was talking about eggs uh, and what happened in Alaska and there was these leaders in the corner of this auditorium and after I was done they all came up to me and said we need to talk to you. So we sat down and they said that they had met with a native corporation leader from Alaska and Canada. And those corporation leaders were brought down to Ecuador to meet with them by USA. And their job was to convince these Amazonian leaders to agree to land claims because it was so beneficial for us in Alaska and in Canada. And Canada, Canadian land claims, Indian land claims, mirrors ICSA. But there's a big difference. They actually had their rights recognized. We didn't. Um, so there's things like that happening around the world that's similar to Alaska with oil and gas development. And then like relocation. All of these small islands, they're looking at relocation, right? And they're climate refugees. They are asking to come. Where are they going to go? Who's going to take them in? And this is where it comes to governments of the world making decisions about this issue and why this issue is at a crisis level and why we have to shift now, globally. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, thank you. Is there something to be learned from the Nunavut scenario where an entire portion of Canada actually got turned over to indigenous people? I mean, I know it's not very populated, maybe that's way easier to do, but is there... I think so, and I, I haven't followed the issue, but... That's the dream for us in Alaska. That's what would restore Alaska. <coughs> and just putting it back to the rightful owners. And uh, I think we would take care of our environment because we have no choice. We survive in the environment. How has the mood of the uh Alaska Native Lands Claim Settlement Act changed since it was established in 71. Is there a general collective mood or sense of the history? It's been 45 years. For years it was just hopeless. We felt helpless, hopeless. No one thought, we thought this passed, there's nothing we can do about it. And as a matter of fact, one of my elders was there in Washington, D.C. when they negotiated the deal. And I was mentored by him. He's an elder. So when I got older, I learned more about it. So I went to him and I questioned him. And I said, why did you guys sign that? Why did you guys agree? It's not a good thing for us. <laughs> and his answer to me was, it happened, it's done, it's in the past, let it go. Don't talk about it. <laughs> that was what happened for years. And then people like me started questioning it. And then the issue came back up. And now the mood is, the people that understand what really happened, they want, they're like, what I'm saying, they want to see some vehicle moved forward to address the wrongs of ANCSA. But there's also champions of ANCSA that were in that room signing that to this day they're always going to be cheerleaders of ANCSA and say it was the best thing that could have ever happened to us. 
and they'll cite um, new schools, health care, that um, funding is derived from oil and gas development or mining, etc. And so there's two different moods about it. And as more people do understand the truth, though, the mood is more towards what are we going to do to fix it? wanted to thank you and I think the most important point for a, a lot of students and, and those of us who are not indigenous to this land is that climate change is not all humans. It's not uh, something we like to say, oh, anthropogenic climate change. All humans are destroying the planet. All humans are doing this. All humans do that. And that all humans have never done anything, that, you know, except perhaps we produce and die, you know. But I think that the notion that there's a totally different value system and that the Western or industrial value system or whatever, however we want to define it, is in opposition to a value system that, that I would say, you know, obviously is coming from indigenous and, and we in this land may have been indigenous somewhere, sometime. But I think that's so important because that gives us hope that it's not a genetic issue. It's not about us as a species. It's about a value system and a culture, and that cultures can be changed. And I think that you know our culture is changing. But to hear your story is is so important. And I you know I teach society and climate change and sustainable society. And even at the end of the semester, students are still saying all humans are doing. I'm like, no, they're not. You know. And so I, I want to thank you for coming all this way to to tell us that. Not all humans look at a tree and say, oh, I can get a hundred dollars for that. Or look at a fish and say, you know, that's that's a commodity. Or look at a river and say, well, that's my property. Or they look at it as, as a living system. And, and so, just thank you. Keep telling that story and that there is hope. We can change the way we think about values. Yeah, yeah I really agree with that. We can change it. It's not a done deal. I completely agree. Do you have any specific recommendations that you, know, you might make to all of us, especially the young people here, as to what we should do like right now or in the next six months or in the next year? You know, just how do you want us to move together? What do you want us to do? Yeah, actions that can be taken um, on the Arctic Refuge issue is engage and if there's a comment period, state your your voice your opinion. Um, learn more about it. Um, on campus, what can you do? You can move towards sustainability. Move your campus towards sustainability. And I don't know what that looks like here. You all have to sit down together and figure that out, but that's an action that can mm -hmm. be done. Um, and get out in the, use social media, and the media itself get the word out about the sustainable movement forward. Learn more about these issues and um, work on these issues. Like there's global climate change discussions happening at the United Nations every year. They're called the COP and I attend them. Um, we take actions on the outside or the inside and I like taking actions on the outside, but I've been on the inside too where you can engage with the leaders, you can lobby governments, you can actually make statements to governments of the world through different organizations that go to and attend those meetings at that level. People are working to make changes and you all can be part of that. Just engage, start here at the local level. I'm sure there's issues here that you can work on and just start moving up, go all the way to the national level and the international level, <coughs> especially with climate change. But uh, moving your campus towards sustainability, that would be a big move. Because if all campuses move towards sustainability, how much of a difference would that make? Just like if all Alaska Native communities were able to get off of 
the grid. If these little tiny communities in Alaska could do it, anyone could do it. And we're so isolated. But we could do it anyway. <coughs> but can I just add something? Yeah. Um, I really appreciate how you've emphasized that we have a choice. And it segues really nicely into the final event of our metanoia, which is a documentary and it's called Time to Choose. And one thing that people underestimate, I know I have lots of conversations with my students, is that they think the technology is in the future and it's yet to be developed. But there's lots of already existing solutions out there that we could embrace. And so this documentary is covering a lot of that. Um, it's, it, it, is, it is down to a matter of choice. Um, there, are, you know, there are some barriers in the way, but there's definitely a lot of technology there. So I definitely invite you to come to this documentary. It's on Earth Day, 5 to 7, it's in our student union theater. And I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to sort of um, make more tangible some of the options we have to sort of at our disposal right now to move towards that. So thank you. Oh, one more question, and then we'll move out to the lobby for food. You, you've had your hand up. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's also related. You mentioned that you had a pilot study for solar power for powering your land off of solar. Can you briefly comment on who was involved in that study, what resources you needed, and where it's at now? It was our tribe, and they worked with, um, I think they're called Earth System, something like that. I don't know. But um, they worked with that group, and they did a pilot project on a community washed area, and that's how they figured we could do our whole community um, become solar driven, become dependent on solar energy, and that's brought in a lot of um, other ideas. I actually was in contact with some uh, Navajo people that are working on bringing sustainable energy to traditional Navajo people. And they live just like us. And there's a whole system, their idea is to run each home um, on solar, wind, and get the whole home individually um, off the grid. And I told them, well, if you can do it down there, then we can do it in Alaska. The only thing that's hindering that project is bringing the person up when it's like 40 below <laughs> to see if it's viable in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to come up there. <laughs> but, um, and then for the community, that other project was solar. It was funding that stopped us. It's millions of dollars, I guess, to bring solar in. And so if we ever become multi-millionaires, <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we're thinking of, just individual homes doing it themselves and sustaining it themselves. Yeah. President Herbst and uh, her, her uh, emails back and forth, uh, you say climate change is the biggest challenge of our time. That, uh, is particularly interested in the undergrads and uh, getting your involvement and in, in being part of the, the solution uh, going ahead. Uh, I can't thank I can't thank you enough for coming. Faith uh, God sister is in hospice at this point in time and had to come all the way from the Arctic College, like she said, over 100 miles north of the Arctic Circle. This was an amazing track, but her message is so important and she's such uh, an important activist and voice that she decided to make the trip and uh, we just can't thank you enough. So.